Welcome to Humble Beginnings, the Undrafted Podcast. I'm your host, Rochelle Hamilton Jr., and this is episode 26 of this podcast, and this has been a true blessing um, to come this far with this podcast. We got a lot going on in the NFL. Week two just passed, and man, there was some crazy, crazy games, crazy things that happened um, over this weekend. The Broncos, they tried to give me another heart attack in the close, close fought battle between them and the Raiders in Denver on Sunday, a close one. Uh, but, you know, I'm not surprised about that. Division games are always close. And then that crazy game up in Green Bay at Lambeau Field between the Packers and the Vikings. Man, those were two roller coaster games and two of the craziest games that I've seen um, in this young NFL season. Then the Patriots, they ended up losing to the Jacksonville Jaguars. But I guess I'm really not surprised about the Patriots losing because the Patriots, they always um, they always kind of stumble early in the season. And then as the season progresses, they always get it together. So I'm not worried about the New England Patriots at all. And if the Jacksonville Jaguars do see New England um, later on in the year in the playoffs, um, they, gotta, they, they have some things to worry about. I mean, I, I know Jacksonville has a great defense, but it's – Really, really hard to beat Tom Brady and the New England Patriots twice within an NFL season. Well, coming up on the show today, we got a lot going on. I uh, got reaction from the Broncos and the Raiders, uh, reaction from Aaron Rodgers and um, Green Bay taking on the Vikings. Josh Gordon was traded to the New England Patriots um, on Monday. Um, Steelers, man, they've got a lot going on. They got a lot of drama going on in that locker room. Uh, we'll talk about if. Hiring John Gruden over in Oakland again was a mistake. Bills Mafia, they're always into some craziness, so we got some news um, on them. Are the Bengals, the Cincinnati Bengals, are they the top squad in the AFC North? Vontae Davis, he retired during halftime on Sunday um, against the Chargers. Uh, Antonio Brown, he's threatening reporters on Twitter, and Antonio Brown's dealing with uh, some personal issues right now. So um, there's some things going on. Um, with him and the Pittsburgh Steelers, like I said earlier. Um, and then I've got uh, later on in This Is Some Bull Jive, that segment, you would be surprised who was voted the best Mexican restaurant in the United States. Well, with all that being said, let's get into the show. Well, before I even start this show, I've got to start this podcast off by correcting myself and apologizing for an error that I made on last episode um, last episode of the podcast, I was discussing Colin Kaepernick and the origin of him kneeling during the protest, and I said Nate Boyer was a Marine, when in fact, Nate Boyer was in the Army. He was a Green Beret. So I want to put that on record, and I want to apologize and correct myself for my error. In the unlikely event that Nate Boyer heard that podcast or hears this particular episode of this podcast, I want to put my apologies on record. Well, the Denver Broncos took on the Raiders Sunday in Denver, and I sincerely hope you had your seatbelt buckled for this one because, man, this game had everything, ups, downs, highs, lows. And if I didn't know any better, I would swear that the Denver Broncos are trying to put me in a hospital because, I mean, this was the second close win in as many weeks of the season. They beat the Oakland Raiders 20-19 to and came back from a 13-point deficit in the second half. Now, my thoughts on this game is, um, first of all, this was a big character win for the Denver Broncos. They dug themselves a big hole early in the game, uh, and they were able to overcome that. So to win that kind of adversity, so to win in the face of that kind of adversity, tells me the mindset and the talent of this squad. This is a tough squad, mentally and physically. This is this This year's squad of the Denver Broncos is tougher than the squad from 2017. I mean, you see that early on. The Denver Broncos had to overcome their mistakes. They had to beat the Raiders, and they had to beat the refs because some of those calls that were made on Sunday were straight up ridiculous, some straight up bull jive. The call that I had the biggest problem with was that touchdown by Cortland Sutton that was called back when clearly Cortland Sutton had possession of the ball and he had both feet inbounds but some way somehow that didn't count as a touchdown and the thing that got me was like 
okay, with that rule, you know you can't bobble the uh, ball as you're falling to the ground. You got to have both feet inbounds, yada, yada, yada. Cortland Sutton met every qualifier for that to be a touchdown. In some way, somehow, the referee, I don't know if he was blind. I don't know if the dude was just having a bad day. I don't know if the dude just felt like robbing the Broncos. That was one of the craziest calls I've ever seen. He was clearly inbounds. He clearly had control of the ball as he was going to the ground. I mean, it was a great play, but some way, somehow, it wasn't a touchdown. But whatever. Anyway, coming out early, the offense looked sluggish in the first half. I mean, they they looked bad. I mean, it's, it's no other way to put it. They were sloppy. They were inconsistent. Case Keenum, uh, he threw an ill-timed interception in the red zone um so the offense i mean they they were inconsistent when they did get a little something something going i mean all of a sudden it just faded out and boom it was like yet here we go here's another three and out from the denver broncos offense their first drives on sunday went just like this punt 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 interception punt then the clock ran out at the end of the second quarter and i'm sitting here starting to think as i'm watching this game I'm like, man, where's the offense from last week? Because that offense last week against Seattle, it was attacking. It was aggressive. It kept drives going. Then they come out this week. They just came out flat. They came out sloppy. They came out inconsistent. They came out sleepy. And I was like, man, this is starting to look a lot like the 2017 Denver Broncos offense. And you know, I'm not going to lie. Going into halftime, I was just like, man, it's it's not looking good for the Broncos because it didn't look like – They were going to be able to shake this funk that they were in. So I'm starting to have flashbacks to the 2017 season when they couldn't do anything right. And it was like, come on, football Jesus. You know, is this really going to be the third year in a row that Denver puts an inept offense on the field? And actually, if you want to count the 2015 offense, even though the Broncos won the Super Bowl um, that year, if it were to continue going down that road, that would have been the fourth year of anemic offense from the Denver Broncos that's not a knock at the 2015 offense but let's be honest the 2015 offense it 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 stuttered but they got it done so I'm not complaining the Broncos were down 12 to 0 at halftime and I'm like dude this team is sleep like dead sleep but Shaq Barrett he came through and he blocked a field goal they kept it from going to 13 to 0 and that made all the difference in that matchup And who would have thought at the time that that was going to be the difference in who won this game and whether or not this game was going to go into overtime. As for the first half Denver defense, the Denver defense was very good in this game. They were really good against the run. uh, But there was a few times in there where Oakland started running the ball up the middle. Marshawn Lynch, he gutted them for a few 16 or 17 yard uh, runs. And I'm like, man. You know, they're killing them up the middle. And then in the past, they started eating up big chunks in the middle of the field. And I'm like, man, the Denver defense, they're showing that vulnerability that they showed last year up the middle. Now, the Denver defense, those boys are fast. Those dudes can flat out fly. These dudes are quick. They got a lot of speed on Denver's defense. So when you try to run something to the outside or you try to throw something to the outside, there's a pretty good chance that the Denver defense is going to shut it down. But up the middle where they showed the struggle at, you know, where they showed the struggle um, pretty much all of last year, they showed the struggle up the middle. So when that started happening, I was kind of like, man, oh, here we go. Um, They're starting to gut us up the middle. And anytime a team can start to gut you in the middle, it's going to make for a long day because as the game goes on, those runs are going to start getting a little bit bigger. Uh, But you know what? I was thinking that and in the second half, Denver's defense got aggressive and, Marshawn Lynch, he had a few big runs of, like I said, 16, 17 yards, but his last 25 runs, he only averaged three yards a carry. So they were able to um, hold Marshawn Lynch uh, pretty much in check. So I was I was really, really happy with that. Domata Pecco had himself a great game on Sunday. He finished with five tackles and one for loss. Domata Pecco, he, that, that fella can flat out play. The second half of the game, that's the part of the game where it was like the Broncos as a whole, they woke up. And it was like, finally, here we go. They came out running the ball well. They came out passing the ball well. Phillip Lindsey is a beast. Like, I love Phillip Lindsey, number 30 for the Denver Broncos. 
He finished with 107 yards on 14 attempts, including that big 53-yard run that he had uh, during the second quarter. Phillip Lindsay is the first undrafted rookie in NFL history to run for 100-plus yards in their first two games. So Denver's streak of finding diamonds in the rough uh, in the form of undrafted rookies continues with Phillip Lindsay and his progress. Phillip Lindsay, man, I, I cannot say enough good things about this guy. And he showed to be a versatile player as well because there were times in Sunday's game where Phillip Lindsay would line up in the running back spot, run it up the middle, and then on the very next play, the Broncos lined him up out wide. So keep your eyes on number 30 in Denver because Phillip Lindsay is proven, he's proven to have the juice. And th- he's proven to be a football player. I love that dude. So with all that, Denver finally got on the board with 9.06 left in the third quarter. But Case Keenum, he showed that toughness and that clutch gene that Denver went out and paid him $18 million for it. Case Keenum led him to pay dirt on a big-time 14-play, 67-yard drive. Now, he had a few third-down conversions uh, on that drive, and I'm like, dude, there it is. That's what the Denver Broncos offense has been missing the last few years. That's what we need because when you can start getting those third-down conversions, when you can keep your offense on the field, that allows your defense to rest up. That allows them uh, to stay fresh, keeps them from getting tired, and if a defense – is fresh and ready to go, they can close it out for you. And I was actually kind of worried about the Denver defense in the first half of the game because the first half of the game, Denver's defense was on the field, it seemed like, for the majority of it. So you could kind of tell coming into halftime that, well, I ain't going to say you can kind of tell. I was kind of worried about them coming out after halftime after getting gashed in the first half, and I'm like, man, I don't know if this defense is going to be able to hold up. But with the offense sustaining drives in the second half, being more aggressive, Denver's defense was able to close it out and come through for him. So Case Keenum on that on that 67-yard drive at the end of it, during that drive, they had a fourth and one uh, where the Broncos went for it. They got aggressive. I loved it. Case Keenum, he he ran he on a Case Keenum on a quarterback keeper. He ran it, he jammed it into the end zone to make the score 19 to 17 Oakland. But you could feel the momentum starting to turn in Denver's favor. Now the last drive, the scoring drive that the Broncos had. Um, was a 65-yard drive that set up Brandon McManus's 36-yard game-winning field goal. And on those two drives, those were the two defining drives of the day. Those were the two defining drives, really, for Case Keenum. Well, actually, I, can't, I, I should rephrase that because the last two games have been defining moments for Case Keenum. Case Keenum has proven to be a tough efficient quarterback and he has a short memory like I like and he has some fire to him like he's a really nice guy but on the field he's got some fire to him and these last few games especially on Sunday he showed why the Broncos went out and got him in the offseason now his interceptions they kind of worry me because he went from three intersections or excuse me his interceptions kind of worry me because he had seven interceptions all last season and now he's got four interceptions in two games but the silver lining to that is he had three interceptions the first game one interception on the in the game this past Sunday so that's that's a good sign right there Cortland Sutton showed big play ability even though he got robbed he actually got robbed twice yesterday but he really got robbed on that touchdown Cole on that touchdown score but Cortland Sutton showed big play ability Cortland Sutton is if he gets his route running down and once he gets more time and more experience, Cortland Sutton's going to be a beast. He's going to be a monster of a draft pick with the Denver Broncos. I'm not going to I'm not really wanting to get into speculation and all that kind of stuff, but I can definitely say that I would not be surprised if Cortland Sutton is Demarius Thomas's replacement in Denver, especially if and I love Demarius Thomas. But he had a big drop late in the fourth quarter. There was nobody within five yards of Demarius Thomas. If he catches that ball and it hits him right in the hands, I mean, it wasn't on Case Keenum. Case Keenum put that ball in Demarius Thomas's number. I mean, right in the middle. There's no way he should have dropped that, dropped that ball. If Demarius Thomas catches that pass, he's in the end zone and the game is over. It hit him in the hands and he dropped it. So I, I don't know, you know, sometimes things happen, and I love Demarius Thomas. I'm not one of those guys that's like, oh, let's get rid of DT. No, I'm not saying that. But I will say that the NFL is a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately type of league, and if Demarius Thomas continues to have drops, 
or issues with drops with Cortland Sutton uh, being that young big receiver that teams like Demarius Thomas the clock might start ticking on him within the next year or two going back to the defense I was kind of worried about the Denver defense early on because I'll be honest Derek Carr Amari Cooper and Jared Cook they was given the secondary that work I mean they were working them and but part of that also and one thing about the defense, I didn't understand why they came out in the first half. The DBs were playing kind of, they were playing like soft zone coverage. And I couldn't understand why, because Denver's strength in the secondary is press man coverage, being aggressive, hitting these receivers at the line and knocking the timing off. I mean, being physical with them. That's Denver's strength in the secondary. And they weren't displaying that. They didn't put that on display the first half. So I'm like, man, what is Denver doing? And, I mean, a quarterback like Derek Carr, he already gets rid of the ball very quickly. He's got a quick release. So with Derek Carr, as soon as the ball is coming or as soon as the ball is hiked, it's basically coming out of his hands. And, I mean, they were shredding him. So I was like, man, here we go. And then even Martavis Bryant, he started getting in on the party. But the second half, Denver's defense uh, got aggressive and locked down on him. Derek Carr finished 29-32 for 288 yards and a touchdown. Von Miller, the man, the machine, the living legend, he came through with the sack, his fourth through two games. Von Miller is poised to have a really big year in 2018. I'm loving it. As for Coach Vance Joseph, I was never one of those people that was like, fire Vance Joseph, get rid of Vance Joseph last year. There were so many fans that kept spitting that noise, and it even turned into a trending hashtag across social media, and it's like, man, Denver fans are, I I love the Broncos. I love Broncos fans, but I'm just going to be honest. Broncos fans are spoiled. Mike Shanahan, John Elway, Terrell Davis, Shannon Sharp, Ed McCaffrey, all these cats back in the late 90s when they brought those Super Bowls to Denver, they set a new standard. And since then, Broncos fans have been so spoiled. I mean, it's not even funny how spoiled Broncos fans are. People forget that when you bring a new head coach into a situation he's got a he's got a learning curve that he has to go through as well then you give uh you give him a quarterback situation like Vance Joseph had last year any coach is going to struggle Denver didn't have a quarterback last year so Vance Joseph comes into this year he's all his seat's already pretty warm coming into the season he's gotten considerably better at coaching especially in situational scenarios and I love what Vance Joseph did now my buddy Alex Valdez over at Mile High Huddle, he pointed this out, and I I 100% agree with it. This is the second straight game that Vance Joseph has outcoached two Super Bowl winning coaches in the fourth quarter. And like I said, I could not agree more. The play calling in the fourth quarter the last two games has been just what the Broncos needed. And it's been the kind of offense, well, as, well as, as well as on the defense, but particularly on the offense, It's been what Vance Joseph called for when he first got to Denver. It's had juice. It's been aggressive. It's been smart. It's been efficient. They went for it on fourth and one late in the fourth quarter yesterday. They got the conversion, kept the drive going. These are the kinds of gutsy, aggressive calls that you need to win close division games, that you need to win games, period, in the NFL. So, like I said, I I like what I'm seeing overall from the Broncos the last few games. They still got a lot of improvements to make, so they still got some work to do, and that's going to come with time and consistency. But the Denver Broncos, they're progressing, and they're finding ways to win close, tough games, and I am absolutely loving it. I love what I see from the Denver Broncos so far. Aaron Rodgers started at quarterback for the Green Bay Packers on Sunday for what was one of the craziest finishes to a game I've ever seen. The Packers and the Vikings tied 29 all in a game that will be remembered just as much the way it all played out as it will be for the way it ended. Now, this was the early game here in Dallas, so this game already had my heart pumping by the time the Broncos took the field. This game here had everything in it as well. This was a roller coaster of a game. But let me be clear when I say this. The Green Bay Packers won that game Sunday. They had that game won. But this BS roughing the passer call on Clay Matthews kept the Vikings in it. The NFL has got to get a hand on its officiating crews. Like, it's almost like the NFL lets anybody ref these games. That was one of the worst calls I have ever seen. That call was some bull jive, period. Clay Matthews was rushing Kirk Cousins, and Cousins had barely got rid of the ball, and Clay Matthews hit him. 
Clay Matthews did not hit Kirk Cousins. There was no helmet-to-helmet contact. Uh, he didn't drive him into the ground, which is a new point of emphasis for the NFL as far as roughing the passer goes. Um, he didn't drive him into the ground. He didn't, like, pick him up and slam him into the ground. It was a textbook tackle on a quarterback. And the way – at first when I saw it, I'm like, okay, that's no biggie. It's just part of football. And then next thing I know, they got a flag on the field. And I'm like, dude, what's what's the issue? Like, it's just a football play. But, no, nah, not in the over-legislated NFL. Like, the ref basically based the call off of the NFL's new rule about driving quarterbacks in the ground or scooping them up and then slamming them into the ground or, or something like that and falling on them or some weird way the NFL's got it worded. And, well, first, it's one of the craziest rules I've ever heard for the simple fact that the NFL seems to have forgotten that we live on Earth, and on Earth there's a force known as gravity that plays a big role when these dudes fall to the ground. Gravity is a part of nature. And try as you might, you have no control over nature. And if you don't believe me, step outside anytime there's a weather event going on. It'll show you how much control you have over Mother Nature, which is none. And this is the kind of stuff that turns the people off from the NFL because I've said this before. The NFL is suffering from a bad case of paralysis by analysis. That's the name of the game in today's NFL. There's no reason the refs should have made that call uh, on Sunday. And then, of course, the NFL, they had to cover their tracks, so they come out and basically say he had the right call and put the blame on Clay Matthews, which was bull jive, but – you know, didn't expect anything different in a call like that. NFL is not going to admit that. Um, but switching gears, though, man, I, I got to say, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers is a man. Like, Aaron Rodgers is a man amongst men because this dude is tough, point blank, period. There's not a person on this earth that can question Aaron Rodgers' toughness and his devotion to his teammates because honestly there is no reason why Aaron Rodgers should have been on that field on Sunday absolutely no reason at all Aaron Rodgers has a bone bruise in his left knee and he played with a brace on which I believe this was the first time in Aaron Rodgers career that he's played with a knee brace and in the 10 years he's been or the, he's been in the league 13 years uh, but the 10 years he's been a starting quarterback Green Bay had 70 snaps on offense on Sunday afternoon. Now, one of the main things that I took away from this game, I went away from this game wondering how long is Green Bay going to be able to keep Aaron Rodgers in the lineup? Because the Vikings, in the first half, the Vikings wasn't really getting, they weren't really getting to him. The second half, the Vikings started getting to him. They started hurrying him. They started hitting him. They had a few sacks on him. Uh, and of course, Aaron Rodgers, he's a mobile quarterback. So, you know, his mobility is a big part of his game. That's part of the that's part of his skill set that makes him so great. He wasn't able to scramble out of the pocket and around the pocket like he normally does. And, you know, with those hits each week and dudes falling on it um, game after game, you know, to me, Green Bay is risking Aaron Rodgers completely tearing his ACL or completely messing up his knee and then having him out for the season. And if Aaron Rodgers is out for the season, Green Bay season is over. But, you know, this is part of the this is the jam that the Green Bay Packers created um, by not having an adequate backup quarterback behind Aaron Rodgers because they don't have a backup that could carry the squad for three to six weeks and only drop one or two games in a winnable fashion on their roster behind him. They don't. You know, Aaron Rodgers was 30 of 42 Sunday, 281 yards and one touchdown. And that's on one knee. Or that's on one leg, excuse me. So when you look at that, that tells me that a hobbled Aaron Rodgers is better than a healthy whoever they have at the backup spot behind him. Nick Wright of Fox Sports last week, he made a really good observation on this exact subject. Aaron Rodgers has no supporting cast when it comes to backup quarterbacks. He already has to struggle with bad defenses, but he has no supporting cast when it comes to backup quarterbacks. Aaron Rodgers was out six weeks last year, and Green Bay was barely alive for the playoffs. They went from Brett Hundley and downgraded to Deshaun Kaiser, and we saw what Deshaun Kaiser did in Cleveland last year. Cleveland didn't win a single game. Now, that's not all Deshaun Kaiser's fault, but that's the kind of environment that Deshaun Kaiser 
comes from. Part of that winlessness is Deshaun Kaiser's fault, but not the whole thing, of course. Aaron Rodgers knows that if he's not in the game, the Packers are going to lose. And think about that for a second. Can you imagine how demoralizing that is that if you're this superstar, you don't even have, you don't even have to put it in the context of football. But think about how demoralizing that is where you're really good at your job, you're one of the best employees that do what you do, and you're a human being, so there are going to be days when you get injured, when you get sick, something happens, and... It's like anytime you're not there, the company just falters. They don't produce. And you don't have any idea how much pressure that is. And as far as the NFL goes, can you imagine how demoralizing and how, how, that, may, how that has to make Aaron Rodgers feel? Because it's like, man, I can't get injured. You know, I'm getting older. I can't get injured. I get hit a lot. And... The NFL is all about winning, so there's this constant pressure to win. There's this constant pressure from your coaches. Uh, In some part, there's the pressure from the devotion to your teammates. And it's just like, man, I can't even be injured and depend on these guys to keep winning. So that way, when I step back in, I can just keep us going and just pick up right where we left off. Like, that, that, I can't, you know... (laughs) That's got to be that's that's got to be kind of demoralizing for Aaron Rodgers. I mean, he'll never come out and say it, of course, but that can't be that great of a feeling for him knowing that if he's not in the lineup, there's a 99 percent chance that the Green Bay Packers are going to lose that game. Can you imagine how demoralizing that is for him to know that he can't depend on the Green Bay Packers front office to get a backup quarterback to hold it down for a few weeks until you're 80, maybe 90 percent and can play? Because then you, at that point, you're still having to sit here and hobble through injuries, and then you're risking, you're risking further injury or worse injury by putting yourself out there and you're already injured. You know, Tom Brady up in New England, he can depend on Brian Hoyer to play if he's hurt. Drew Brees down in New Orleans, he has Teddy Bridgewater to fall back on if he can't go. The Vikings, they had Case Keenum last year to hold it down while Sam Bradford was out. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have any of that. Green Bay has no running game. They were the third worst running team in the league in week one. Check out the Packers backup quarterbacks from the last few years and just listen to this list. Brett Hundley, Deshaun Kaiser, Joe Callahan, Scott Tolzien, Matt Flynn. Even the Jets up in New York, Sam Darnold has Josh McCown, a veteran, a smart veteran backup quarterback, backing him up. The Jets saw the backup quarterback position as being so important They are paying Josh McCown $10 million to back up Sam Darnold. That's how important some teams see the backup quarterback spot, which which you should, because if if your star quarterback is injured, the most important position in all of sports, if this dude can't go, you got to have somebody in there that can hold it down until he gets back. So, you know, come on, Green Bay. You have got to give this man something to back him up. Moving on with the low with Rowe. This past Saturday, the Cleveland Browns announced that they were getting ready to release wide receiver Josh Gordon. Uh, They said they were going to release him this past Monday, but they ended up trading him to New England for a fifth-round pick Monday afternoon. All of this comes after Gordon took a hiatus away from the team earlier in the offseason, and he missed basically all of training camp to get his mental and physical health on track, according to Gordon. This trade officially ends Josh Gordon's six-year tenure with the Cleveland Browns. Mary Kay Cabot of Cleveland.com said Cleveland reportedly was concerned about him relapsing, I guess, back into substance abuse. Apparently, Josh Gordon showed up at the Cleveland Browns facility Saturday afternoon. I guess he was like late for a meeting or something like that. And he wasn't, according to the Browns, he just didn't seem like himself. He just didn't seem quite right. So with that, they were kind of concerned that, you know, maybe he's had another run in um, with substance abuse because Josh Gordon has had plenty of these issues in the past. And as a result, the Browns, they made the decision to go ahead and make the move. Now, with this, I I really hate to hear how things ended between Cleveland and Josh Gordon because the Cleveland Browns, they they bent over backwards, forwards, sides, angles, every which way. They gave Josh Gordon every resource to try to help him get through his um, struggles. 
And unfortunately, it just seems like Josh Gordon can't quite shake his demons. And, you know, we've all got our shortcomings. We've all got our downfalls. And, you know, unfortunately, Josh Gordon, he seems to be struggling with that. Now, with this, this is bigger than football. And I'm really pulling for Josh Gordon, not from a football standpoint. I mean, I, I like him as a football player. The dude has got Hall of Fame talent. I mean, he is the kind of wide receiver that can literally just dominate and take over a game. I mean, the dude is, what, 6'3", 6'4", you know, 225 pounds. So he's that big, big play receiver. I mean, he's got, like, it's almost like T.O.-like ability to just dominate and take over a game. I mean, the dude, he is a physical specimen on the field. But the the, the sad thing is he, he can't seem to stay on the field. Well, the last few years he hadn't been able to stay on the field um, because of his off-the-field struggles. So, you know, this is bigger than football. So aside from football, I want to see Josh Gordon get his life together. And with him going to the Patriots, Maybe, just maybe, that's the kind of environment that he needs. Sometimes sometimes all a guy needs is a change in scenery, is a change in the way um, the people around him do things. And maybe Cleveland was so supportive of him to a fault um, that maybe in some ways it might have even enabled him because he knew that he was going to have them to fall back on. So now with him going over to New England, well, New England, I mean, this is a low-risk, high-reward signing for them because if this works out, this is a big play receiver that they have not had basically since the days uh, since Randy Moss was up there. And once Julian Edelman comes back from his suspension, you're going to have Edelman to deal with, you'll have Josh Gordon to deal with, and you'll have Rob Gronkowski to deal with. So that New England wide receiver core is going to be nice because you're not going to really be able to double team him because if you double team Rob Gronkowski – well, now you got to deal with Josh Gordon and vice versa. If you double team Josh Gordon, well, you got to figure out how you're going to cover Rob Gronkowski. Then you got Julian Edelman who can eat up the middle of the field and get those, you know, he can get those, you know, 10, 15 yard chunks or those, you know, five, six, 10 yard chunks of yardage um, that keeps the drive alive and keeps the Patriots marching down the field. So if this move works out for the New England Patriots, they're going to be tough to defeat coming out of the AFC. So, You know, I hope and pray that Josh Gordon can get it together, and I would like to see him succeed with the Patriots because that would be big. That would be a big resuscitation to his football career. So I would love to see that. Um, Moving forward, though, football-wise, you know, I can't help but wonder if this is the break that Dez Bryant needed to finally get back into the NFL. They had that big meeting a few weeks ago, if you remember, that they showed on Hard Knocks where he walked into the facility. And, I mean, he was introducing himself to everybody. I mean, he was walking up, dabbing people. Hey, man, you know, what's up, man? I'm Dez, this and that and the other. I mean, he walked in like – I mean, he basically, the way he walked in and the way it was portrayed, it seemed like this contract was happening. Dez Bryant was about to be back in the NFL. He was about to be a Cleveland Brown. And, like, this thing was going down. So – I'm seeing him walk through the facility. Hey, man, you know, what's up, man? I'm Dez. Nice to meet you, yada, yada, yada. He dapping folks up and everything. So I'm thinking this is a done deal. Dez is finally about to be back on the squad. His contract's about to be signed. And then, boom, Josh Gordon comes back to the team, talks between Dez and the Browns. They break down. The rest is history. So now with Cleveland needing a big play wide receiver and Dez needing a job, is this thing finally going to go down? Well, of course, that remains to be seen. But if I'm Dez Bryant, if the Cleveland Browns call my phone, I go. Because I look at it like, okay, take this prove-it deal for this season. Show the NFL you still got some gas in the tank because you want to put some good work on tape, and then you can take it from there. All you need to do is just show somebody that you can still play. Because NFL teams have proven through the past you know, countless times, thousands of times, that if a guy still shows that he has some gas left in the tank, out of these 32 teams, there's somebody out there that's going to take a chance on you. You just have to figure out yourself if you still want to continue playing football. Now, it was reported earlier in the offseason that Baltimore offered him a three-year contract worth like $21 million, which is basically the market um, for a receiver with, in, in Dez's position. Dez turned that down, and it didn't work out with Cleveland the first time. So it's like, okay, well, you know, what's going on 
What's what's going to happen with Dez now? Because Dez Bryant is 29 years old. He's an aging wide receiver in a league that thrives on young guys. The NFL thrives on young guys. Youth is what drives the NFL, basically. Now, Dez still has some juice left, but he's lost some skills. Dez Bryant does not have a lot of time to get back into the NFL because I could be wrong, but if Dez Bryant misses the entire 2018 NFL season, there's a very, very, very good chance that he doesn't play in the NFL again because each and every year there's young wide receivers who are bigger, who are faster, who can run routes better, they can run more routes, and they've got just as good a hand, if not better, and they're coming out of the draft each and every year. And it's already been kind of tough for Dez to find a fit, to find a team as it is. Even after all the good years that he had in Dallas, even though he kind of struggled the last few years, he still had a halfway decent year last year. It's just the Cowboys didn't want to pay him the kind of money they were paying him for his production. So he still got some gas left in the tank, but it's like, okay, well, what, does he want to, what is he going to do with it? So with all that being said, the ball is on Des Bryant's side of the field. Now he has to decide whether or not he's going to go for it. The Pittsburgh Steelers removed Le'Veon Bell off the running back death chart last week. Now this comes on the heels as the entire offensive line took their grievances with L. Bell public and they called him out in the media. They counted this dude's money and everything and then went public with it. They could not wait to get the, they couldn't wait to get in front of those cameras. They couldn't wait to drop those sound bites. They couldn't wait to throw this dude under the bus publicly. So now with L. Bell off the death chart, what does all this mean? Well, this particular move, it almost seems to me like the Steelers are telling him that they're ready to move on. This means that more than likely Le'Veon Bell is not showing up in Pittsburgh anytime soon. This, uh, this basically means that Le'Veon Bell is probably going to wait until after week 10 and then show up and then come in. You know, I think he has up to week 11 to show up and then he can still accrue the full year towards free agency and then he can be a free agent and then he can chunk the deuces to the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's basically what all this means. That's what it's looking like, because he still has showed no signs of even being remotely close to showing up in Pittsburgh. And that Pittsburgh locker room is a mess right now, because they got this going on. They got everything going on with Antonio Brown. And yeah, Pittsburgh is, is going through some rough times. Now, as far as their running back depth chart, as of right now with L. Bell being off, off the roster, First string running back, James Conner. Second string running back, Jalen Samuels. Third string running back, Stephen Ridley. TMZ reported last week that Bell was spotted out at uh, some nightclubs in Miami South Beach. So now you got Pittsburgh who's struggling. They haven't won a game the uh, whole season. They lost to the Chiefs Sunday. They gave up 42 points at home to the Kansas City Chiefs. And then the week before that, they tied with the Cleveland Browns, who have consistently been the worst team in the NFL. And now you got L. Bell down in Miami partying it up, taking pictures with people. I mean, rubbing it in the front office's face. So, you know, with all of this going on, and now you got them taking them off the depth chart, it's like, dude, what is Pittsburgh doing, man? Because they go into a standoff with their best offensive player. They haven't won a game, a single game in 2018. Yeah, they tied with the Browns, but a tie is not a win. If Le'Veon Bell is in the lineup, the Pittsburgh Steelers are easily 2-0 right now. Easily. And, like, and I mentioned Antonio Brown. I haven't even gotten into the, the craziness that's surrounding Antonio Brown right now. I mean, he's threatening reporters on Twitter. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then he got upset with a, a former Pittsburgh Steelers public relations um, employee on Twitter. And then he, you know, I guess he was joking around when he said it, but he said, trade me and let's see what's up. Because I guess the PR guy was talking some trash to him, basically said if he didn't have Ben Roethlisberger as his quarterback, his stats wouldn't be the, his stats wouldn't be what they are. And Antonio Brown wouldn't be the receiver that he is. So Antonio Brown, he basically told him, trade me and let's find out. Now, it, it, to me, it, it it sounds like a joke, but of course, when he said it, like the internet just went into a frenzy. So with all that, the Pittsburgh Steelers are a train wreck right now. I mean, they are an absolute train wreck. 
Because this is a team where you know it's bad, but you just cannot look away from what's going on. And as far as L. Bell goes, Le'Veon Bell is doing exactly what he needs to do. Because the Steelers, they're not going to do anything except run him into the ground. And then once he's all used up, they can't get any more production out of him. They're going to trade him or they're going to cut him. That's what these NFL teams do. They always do that. They'll run these dudes into the ground. They'll get all the production that they can out of them. And then they'll try to pay the lowest dollar at the same time. And if a player outperforms their contract like L. Bell has, they expect them to honor the contract. But if a player underperforms on his contract, they cut them or they trade them, and then they chalk it up to just business. Well, this is just business on Le'Veon Bell's part. Pittsburgh is just a hot mess right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's no other way to put it. Pittsburgh is a hot mess. So something's got to change. So L. Bell clearly has no plans to show up in Pittsburgh anytime soon. So like I said earlier, it looks like he's going to wait until about week 10 to show up get his accrued year towards free agency, and then he's going to chunk Pittsburgh the deuces. I'm going to switch it up a little bit. It's time for I'm in, I'm out. Let's see what I'm in or I'm out on today. Things have not started off smoothly for John Gruden in Oakland. We knew that there would be some big changes when he returned because there always is a big change anytime you have a head coaching change. But John Gruden is an old school coach. So for many of these players, this was going to be a big culture shock with him coming into the locker room. After trading one of the locker room leaders in Khalil Mack and a disappointing showing in game one against the Rams and then game two against the Broncos, things did not look all that hot for John Gruden in Oaktown. Is this starting to show that hiring John Gruden was a mistake by the Oakland Raiders? I'm out on that take for now. Because calling this a mistake this early in the season is a big overreaction because Oakland may be struggling right now. And, you know, we got 16 weeks in the season. They may be struggling right now, but it's a long season. A lot can happen between game two and game 16 in the NFL. And I think the reason why a lot of people are saying that it might have been a mistake is there's there's some there's some. Uh, the residual effect of him trading Khalil Mack, which Khalil Mack is, he's making John Gruden and the Raiders look like absolute fools over in Chicago because Khalil Mack, is, he's wrecking shop. I mean, he's wrecking games, sacking quarterbacks, causing fumbles, scoring touchdowns, getting interceptions. Khalil Mack is doing the fool over in Chicago. And as a result, he has John Gruden and the Oakland Raiders looking like some fools. Now, from the jump, I wasn't sure about the John Gruden hire because I wasn't even sure if he was the best hire because John Gruden had been away from the game for nearly 10 years. A lot has changed in the NFL since the last time John Gruden coached. He's an old school dude, so it won- so that made you wonder if his brand of coaching would make it in today's NFL because dudes are coming in today. These dudes today are not the same as the guys that came in in 2008. These guys coming in today, they got big social media presences They have brands going on. They have a full-fledged marketing team. I mean, these dudes coming in today, I mean, they're they're like business enterprises almost, man. I mean, it's, it's a different mentality. It's a different way of moving in the NFL when these guys come in today. But with all that being said, calling this a mistake this early in the season is a big overreaction. Now, don't get me wrong. I thought the Raiders were insane for the kind of contract that they gave him. 10 years at $100 million guaranteed? Now, I'm not going to say hiring John Gruden was a mistake. The actual hire of John Gruden was a mistake. But I will say that the longevity of that contract and the amount of money guaranteed in that contract, those were mistakes. Because anytime you guarantee a guy money in a contract, you have to put that in escrow, which means you have to set that money to the side because that money has got to be paid to this guy because it's guaranteed. There's no way I would have made that kind of offer. $100 million guaranteed for a coach. Most coaches' contracts go for, at the most, five, maybe six years. I mean, very rarely in the NFL do you see a contract go over five years. Five years in the NFL is a long time. So 10 years is an eternity in this league. And on top of that, 10 years, $100 million guaranteed. What exactly has John Gruden done for the Raiders or any other squad to guarantee that kind of long-term money and that kind of long-term security? John Gruden in the past has proven to be a good coach. 
I mean, he hadn't really done a whole lot against the Broncos because I think he's like 1-10 against the Broncos because the Broncos been giving John Gruden that work over the years. But overall, John Gruden, he's a pretty good football coach. Now, he won a Super Bowl with the Buccaneers, of course, back in the day, but those were Tony, those were Tony Dungy's players. Let's just be honest. John Gruden just rode the coattails to that Super Bowl. Now, he led Oakland to a Super Bowl, but of course, they lost that one. He started off on the wrong foot by not even talking to Khalil Mack. Khalil Mack, he's a great dude on the field. He's a beast on the field. Great dude off the field. One of the leaders in the locker room. One of the leaders of the team. The Raiders drafted Khalil Mack. So this is a guy that you drafted. It's extremely hard to find a guy with Khalil Mack's production in the draft. I mean, that's why when teams hit on guys like Khalil Mack, Von Miller, Aaron Donald, when they hit on these kind of dudes, pass rushers are hard to find in the NFL. And that's why when teams hit on a pass rusher, they do everything they can to keep them. That's why you had the Broncos pay Von Miller $19.5 million a year. That's why you saw the Los Angeles Rams just give Aaron Donald that record-setting contract a few weeks ago. Pass rushers like these dudes do not grow on trees. And, And really with a guy like Aaron Donald, he's an interior lineman, so it's even harder for him to get sacks, and he's still wreaking havoc. So these dudes don't grow on trees, and that's why... When all of this was happening, it's like, dude, what is John Gruden and the Raiders doing? You know, I, I, I haven't seen anything like that. I still can't believe they got rid of Khalil Mack. Now, with the Raiders being in the same division as the Broncos, I am extremely glad they got rid of Khalil Mack because I'll straight up be honest. If Khalil Mack was on that Raiders team Sunday, they win that game against the Broncos. That, that's the kind of impact that Khalil Mack brings to a football team. Even more head-scratching about this whole Khalil Mack deal is that um, during the game against the Rams week one, one of the commentators said, you know, these play-by-play commentators and the uh, color analysts, the day before the game, they meet with certain players and coaches on the squad. You know, they'll talk to them about, you know, their career, you know, how they're feeling. You know, they get to know the player and, uh, you know, they meet with them for, you know, 30, 45 minutes, however long, and they just talk to the guy. And they said they sat down and talked to Khalil Mack And he said, now I'm a paraphrasing, but he said he asked Khalil Mack if John Gruden would have just picked up the phone and said, you know, hey, man, I think we got off on the wrong foot. You know, let's sit down. Let's talk everything out. I want to see where you're coming from. You can hear where I'm coming from and we can just take it from there. If John Gruden would have done that, would that have made a difference? And you know what Khalil Mack said? Yes. So that tells you everything you need to know about that situation there. Then they turn around, they give Pittsburgh a third round pick for Martavis Bryant. Then they release him a few days later because of a a possible suspension. Then they bring him back on a one-year deal. So I'm sitting here on the outside looking in. I'm like, dude, what is is Oakland doing? I I don't even think Oakland knows what Oakland is doing. And you also, now, now with these two transactions, You've got to look at how these kinds of transactions look to the players in the locker room. Because you let one of our guys go who did everything right. He came in here. He took care of his body. He ate right. He lifted hard. He ran hard. He played hard. He was one of the leaders in the locker room. You trade a guy who was good for the team. He was good for the locker room. But this dude here who's had multiple suspensions been in and out of the the NFL's like drug abuse program or whatever and you give this dude multiple chances a guy who's been in and out of trouble suspensions and all you bend over backwards to keep him then after the Rams game he threw Derek Carr under the bus in the press conference he said he missed Amari Cooper on some throws um yeah I it's yeah Oakland is Oakland is and they're in a whirlwind basically now I'll give Oakland their props because they actually played Denver really good on Sunday and to be quite honest with you it's a good thing that NFL games are four quarters instead of two because if they were only two quarters the Oakland Raiders would have shut Denver out on Sunday they also would have beat the the Los Angeles Rams on Sunday because they played the Rams really well in week one in the first half The thing with John Gruden in Oakland is right now, they've just got to learn how to finish games. Once the Raiders figure out how to finish games and how to stay consistent in the second half, I think they'll be a halfway decent team. Tailgating is one of the best parts about football. Like, I love to tailgate. 
you get to meet all kinds of people, especially you get to see all the honeys out there at the game. You get to eat all this great food. You get to get your drink on. You get to see the honeys. Now, as far as the drinking goes, I'm not a big drinker, you know, so now I'll go if, if I go to a game and I tailgate, I don't mind getting an adult beverage or two. And when I say or two, I do mean two because two is my limit. Uh, but Bills fans, man, they take tailgating to another level. The famous Bills Mafia, they've grown in popularity over the last few years by viral videos of them jumping through tables, body slamming each other and other tailgate craziness. Well, now they can actually be criminally charged if they're caught by police doing this. I am all the way out on this because I love Bills Mafia. Bills Mafia is crazy. They are so much fun to watch. And like I said, they're a crazy bunch, but it's so much fun to watch these people. Like I could get on those. I could get on the YouTube and watch those <laughs> watch those videos of them acting a fool all doggone day. Like, I, Bill's Mafia, they, they got a special place in my heart. I, I like those crazy fans, man. They're, my favorite one, my favorite video clip of Bill's Mafia is there's this one video where they're playing a drinking game, clearly. This dude takes a shot of something, and I don't know what the name of the game is called, but it's where you bend down and you put your the, you put your forehead on the baseball bat and you spin around like nine or ten times. And this is one of the fun the, this is one of the funniest videos I've seen. He takes a shot. He does this little. He spins around on this baseball bat like ten times. Then the dude just face plants. I mean, falls face first into this bus that's like ten feet away from him. I mean, it is one of the funniest videos I have ever seen. If you want to check it out, go on YouTube and just type in Bill's Mafia and you'll stumble upon it. It's like one of the first ones you can see. That's all been in the last few years. And of course, law enforcement has to get involved. And now they just got to mess up all the fun. <sighs> as, as it is always. Well, on top of all this, but see, here's the thing, though. With law enforcement getting involved, it's like, man, okay, yes, they're acting crazy. Yes, they're being silly. But when you really think about it, who is, Bill, who is Bill's mafia hurting outside of themselves, of course? I mean, it's like, come on, police, man. Let these people hurt themselves in peace. Now, the Erie County Sheriff's Office, they said deputies are focusing on eliminating the excessive consumption of alcohol. Well, when I read that, I'm like, okay. I can understand where they're, where that's coming from, and I actually agree with that because we have because as much as I like seeing Bills Mafia get crazy in the parking lot before the game, we have way 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 too many alcohol related deaths and injuries in the United States. So while there's a part of me that's kind of sad there won't be as many Bills Mafia videos floating around on YouTube, from that aspect of the consumption of alcohol. I'm all the way in on that one. For the last bit of I'm in, I'm out, we go back to the AFC North with the Cincinnati Bengals. The Bengals defeated the Ravens Thursday night, 34 to 23. Bengals quarterback Andy Dalton, he completed 24 of 42 passes for 265 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions, while Ravens quarterback Joe Flacco, he had a terrible game. He was 32 of 55 for 376 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions, was sacked four times, and he had three turnovers. The Bengals' 2-0 start marks their best start since the 2015 season, which is the last time they made the playoffs. So with all that, are the Bengals the top squad in the AFC North? I'm out on this for now. And the only reason why I say for now is because the Steelers, they still have more talent, um, even though their locker room is in absolute shambles right now. The Pittsburgh Steelers just can't seem to stick together as a team, which is a big reason why, despite all of the big names and the talent that they have on that roster, they just cannot seem to win another Super Bowl. Now, in this game last Thursday, the Ravens fell down by three scores, 21-0 early in this game. Joe Flacco had a bad game, and, and that's putting it nicely, because even though the score was 34-23, if you saw the game, that game shouldn't have even been that close. Thursday's game makes you wonder, was it more about the Bengals playing well or was it more about Joe Flacco and the Ravens playing poorly? And personally, I think it was a little bit of both 
Because the Ravens, if you remember back to week one, they beat the brakes off the Buffalo Bills 47-3. to But with that game, you kind of have to wonder, was it like, okay, well, were the Ravens that good or were the Bills just that trash where it happened? And if you've seen everything that's going on with the Buffalo Bills, the Bills are, are – they're that bad. But the reason why – another reason why I say for now – is the Cincinnati Bengals, they're hard to trust, especially so early in the season because they've done this before where they look like a legitimate contender in the division and in the AFC as a whole. And then as time goes on, they just straight up fizzle out. So, you know, with that, they're just a little, they're, they're a little bit too much. There's a little too much inconsistency for me to really hop on the Bengals bandwagon right now. I mean, I like Andy Dalton, but the thing that gets me with big Andy Dalton is Andy Dalton plays just good enough at times to fool you into thinking that he's on the cusp of cracking into that, you know, that tier two quarterback category, that very good quarterback category, and then he just bombs out. But there's a part of me that wants to see the Bengals break out this season. I really want to see the Bengals break out in this division because it's going to be between, well, either them or the Browns. Like, I want to see either one of these two teams take the division because I love pulling for the underdog. I love a good underdog story. And I also want to see if Marvin Lewis can turn his 0-7 playoff record. I want to see if he can turn that around eventually. Um, Cause Marvin Lewis, he's a good dude. And I, you know, he's the, I think he's the second longest tenured coach uh, in the NFL behind Bill Belichick up in new England. And another thing, if you really look at the AFC North, the AFC, if you look at the AFC North, the AFC North is the only division in the NFL where potentially every single head coach is on the hot seat. Think about it. Mike Tomlin, his seat is getting warmer because I've talked about Pittsburgh and the things that they've got going on a few times over this podcast. They can't seem to keep their internal issues internal. That translates to L's on the field, as we're seeing in Pittsburgh now. Hugh Jackson, he's only won one game the last two years. Yeah, they tied with Pittsburgh, but a tie doesn't mean anything. John Harbaugh, he's he's basically gone in Baltimore if they miss the playoffs for the third straight year. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in the AFC North, and this is this division is literally up for grabs by any one of these four teams. There's not a team, there's not like a clear-cut winner or a clear-cut choice standout team in the AFC North right now. This division is more than likely going to go back and forth between the Bengals and the Ravens. Troy Aikman said in Thursday's broadcast that Joe Flacco was probably not happy with lining up as a, as a wide receiver and having to give up snaps to Lamar Jackson when they would bring him in on those gadget plays. And while I get what Troy Aikman is saying, and he's speaking from experience as a quarterback, I get what he's saying, but that's Joe Flacco's fault at the end of the day. Because if Joe Flacco was the kind of quarterback that the Baltimore Ravens have paid him to be, Lamar Jackson wouldn't even be on the roster. They wouldn't have even traded back into the first round to even be in the position to draft Lamar Jackson. If you remember back, the Ravens signed Joe Flacco to a five-year, $112 million contract after they won Super Bowl forty-seven. Joe Flacco makes $24.5 million a year. For that kind of investment, when a team pays you that kind of money, they're saying, okay, man, you know what? You're my quarterback. We're not looking for a quarterback for the next five to 10 years at least. So if I'm paying this dude this kind of money, all right, I got a quarterback. I can go find a receiver. I can go find uh, some running backs. I can go find some offensive linemen, some tight ends. I can shore up my defense with linebackers and safeties. I can do all kinds of things now that I got my quarterback set. But Joe Flacco's production the last five years, he hasn't given the Ravens that kind of luxury. And to be quite honest with you, you could probably argue that the only reason why Joe Flacco is even still on the Baltimore Ravens roster is because Baltimore hasn't found a guy that they felt was at least decent enough to replace him until they ran across Lamar Jackson because they traded back into the first round to draft Lamar Jackson. Teams do not draft quarterbacks in the first round to have them sit for very long anymore that just doesn't happen some people bring up baker mayfield and tyrod taylor but if cleveland continues to struggle as this season goes on baker mayfield's going to start sooner rather than later but going back to joe flacco since he got that big contract though 
He's 39 and 37 as a starter. He's second in interceptions only to Eli Manning. And the Ravens have missed the playoffs four out of the last five years. So with all that being said, Joe Flacco should be mad about losing snaps to Lamar Jackson. The competitor in him should be ticked off. But Joe Flacco should not be mad at the Ravens at all. Joe Flacco should be mad at himself because he put himself in this position. Normally when a guy is paid like Joe Flacco is being paid and he doesn't play well, he's gone. And if I am a Baltimore Ravens fan, I'm hot as fish grease when I think about the last five years. Well, that's it for I'm In, I'm Out. So with that, you know what time it is. It's time for This Is Some Bull Jive. Vontae Davis retired from the NFL at halftime Sunday during the Bills' 31-20 loss to the Los Angeles Chargers. Yes, you heard me. He retired from the NFL at halftime during a game. Now, in a statement that he released shortly after, Vontae Davis said he meant no disrespect to his teammates or his coaches. He said he, he just felt the sacrifice of playing through injuries and the physical challenge of football weren't worth it anymore. Translation, the Buffalo Bills are terrible, and this is not worth me putting my body and my health on the line week in and week out for a team that isn't going anywhere. This is some bull jive on two aspects because do you realize how bad a team has to be for a dude to give up during halftime? Like he didn't just give up on this game. He didn't just say, man, you know what? I'm done with this game, this and that and the other, or the team. Like he gave up on his career during halftime. He didn't even wait till the game was over to retire. That's how bad the bills are. And from that aspect, I get why he did it. Because the Buffalo Bills, are not going anywhere. This is the team that had Tyrod Taylor as their quarterback last year. They bench him in a game against these same, um, well, they bench him the week before. Then they put Nathan Peterman in as a starter against these same Los Angeles Chargers. Nathan Peterman, he walks in, throws five picks in the game. They got to go back to Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod Taylor leads them to their first playoff berth in 17 years. Well, Their repayment to Tyrod Taylor for doing all that for him, they basically cut it. They traded him, I think, over to the – I think they traded Tyrod Taylor uh, over to the Browns. So now they got Nathan Peterman and Josh Allen, who they just drafted uh, in this year's draft, as their quarterbacks. So their quarterback situation is a mess. Like, the Bills as a a team are a mess. So on that aspect, I can't blame Vontae Davis for feeling the way he felt – but from his angle, it's bull jive as well. Because it's like, bro, you couldn't wait it to at least after the game to just walk into the coach's office and just say, hey, coach, you know what? Mentally, I'm not here anymore. Physically, my body cannot take – it can't take the grind of an NFL season anymore. Like, coach, I'm hanging up my cleats. Like, he couldn't have even done that because – and then on top of that, like, the Bills had already – they had already paid him, I think it was $3.5 million dollars. Uh, up into this game on Sunday, you know, because you had to think about it. You know, at the end of the day, this was a team that took a chance on you. And this is a team that paid you, they paid you some money to fulfill a service. And, you know, when, you know, at, at a time when a lot of other teams weren't looking at you, the Bills, they decided to take a shot. Now, when the Bills came calling, you didn't have to go up there and accept the money. You could have turned them down. So from that aspect, it's like, okay, and then on top of that, the game Sunday, they put him in as starter. And I, and I guess from him as a 10-year NFL veteran, he was looking at the fact of like, okay, well, I got a chance to make, you know, $5 million. So for a 10-year NFL veteran, Vontae Davis had already made over $50 million in his career. So having already made all that kind of money over the course of his career, $5 million to a 10-year NFL vet, it's like, okay, well, this is easy money. I can just go put in, put in this work. I can make that in my sleep. So then the Bills, they start having all these injuries to the secondary. When then he gets put into a starter position, he gets burned for a touchdown deep by one of the San Diego receivers. Uh, The Bills coach, Sean McDermott, basically puts him on the bench. So he's standing on the sideline. So it's like, dude, you're standing on the sideline. The rest of the game, you're still being paid either way. From, you know, and also, what about what about giving your teammates and your coaches somewhat of a heads up? I mean, you couldn't have even waited till Monday to just walk in the coach's office and just say, Coach, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. 
um, to close out my career, but my body is not going to make it through this season. My mind is not going to make it through this season. You know, it's one thing for a guy to be tired of the NFL grind because you do get tired of waking up for these meetings. You get tired of eating a certain way to keep your body right. You get tired of lifting all these weights. You get tired of running all these routes. You get tired of doing all that conditioning. And, you know, and once the mind is tired, the body's going to follow. So, you know, he could have just came back out on the field, out on the sideline. He wasn't going to play very much the last two quarters of the game. He could have just did that and just been there just in case the team needed him. And then after the game, hung it up. But, you know, while I do understand why Vontae Davis did what he did, I completely understand it. Vontae Davis, that was some bull jive. This next topic in This Is Some Bull Jive, this really got me because this is some bull jive. Taco Bell was voted the best Mexican restaurant in the United States. Yes, you heard me right. Taco Bell was voted the best Mexican restaurant in the United States. The Harris Poll, a nationwide customer survey of people's favorite brands, released their 2018 results last week. And they had the nerve, the gall, the audacity to say that Taco Bell is the best Mexican restaurant. This is some bull jive, period. This is why countries don't like us. Now, this poll surveyed more than 77,000 customers in the United States on more than 3,000 brands. Well, let me just say, these 77,000 people have no idea what they're talking about. Now, don't get me wrong. I like Taco Bell. I really do. Especially late at night when I was in my party days. You know, I stopped by there and gave me a Mexican pizza with no beans. The double-decker taco and a soft taco. Man, wash it down with a Dr. Pepper. Pshh. So trust me, like, I love Taco Bell. They got really good food. Now, I don't eat it like I used to, but Taco Bell has good food. Taco Bell, but see, the thing with Taco Bell is, Taco Bell is the Americanized version of Mexican food. Now, while Taco Bell has really good food, one another thing, Taco Bell has really good food, but they also have really good branding and marketing. Like, they do a great job of hitting their target audience. And so, you know, Taco Bell's really good about staying in their lane. So this whole ranking is not Taco Bell's fault by any means. And, I, you know, matter of fact, talking about Taco Bell's marketing and branding, I still remember that little chihuahua from the 90s. Like when that Godzilla movie came out in 1998 and he had that commercial, here, lizard, lizard. <laughs> like that was one of the funniest commercials I have ever seen. And I still remember that. So Taco Bell's really good at what they do. But, yeah, I, I can't believe these people even fix their mouths to even ask this question. This is just like saying Pizza Hut is the best Italian food or something like that. Pizza Hut has really good pizza. And I used to work at Pizza Hut. So, you know, trust me, there's a Pizza Hut has a special place in my heart because I worked there through college. So Pizza Hut, yeah, Pizza Hut is always good with me. But Pizza Hut, is, it's not Italian food. It's Americanized pizza. Um, now there, now the other brands that were mentioned on this list, five guys was voted the best burger chain, which is some bull jive because five guys ain't touching Whataburger. I don't, I don't care what anybody says. Five guys is not touching Whataburger. Chick-fil-A was voted the best chicken restaurant chain, uh, which kind of hard to argue with that. But then too, it's like, eh, they've never heard of Frenchies down in Houston, mm, but okay. You know, I, I I won't argue. Subway and Panera Bread, they tied for the best sandwich chain. I don't know how I feel about that because I love me some Schlotzky's. But, you know, it is what it is. You can see the whole list on the Harris Poll's website. Taco Bell is the best Mexican food? Come on, man. That's some bull jive. Well, that's it for this episode of the Undrafted Podcast. Some notable games this weekend in the NFL. The Broncos take on the Ravens. Saints take on the Falcons, and that, that rivalry right there, that is always a good game between those two squads. The Chargers take on the Rams for the Battle of L.A. Cowboys, uh, they take on the Seahawks up in Seattle. The Patriots, they take on the Lions, so it's going to be the student versus the teacher in Bill Belichick. 
and Matt Patricia as he's the head coach, the new head coach of the Detroit Lions. And we got the Pittsburgh Steelers taking on the Red Hot Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Some notable college games, Michigan takes on Nebraska and then Alabama's taking on Texas A&M. I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for blessing me with the gifts, talents, and resources to do this podcast. Thank you for tuning in to this podcast. And I want to leave you with this today. Psalm 27.1 The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So always remember, do your best and let God handle the rest. Be blessed.